we have limited number of the participants on the sites, uh, and but we abide to all the social distancing rules to keep everyone safe. But with the trend of the current times, uh, this meeting is also open to you, dear online audience of at Evana platform. And um, today, I would like to invite you to a journey on the intersection of psychology, social complexity science, and agility. That's gonna lead us by our your guest, Joseph. And after his talk, um, we will have a questions and answers sessions, and you can please provide your questions on the chat window at Evanar platform. <coughs> at the end, we'll collect and address questions from both on-site audience and the online. And then, without further ado, Joseph, it's a great pleasure of mine to welcome you to our stage. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not only the applause, it's the fact this is my first talk in front of people since too long. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to uh, this talk on the psychology of estimating. Um, this is a talk that's near and dear to my heart. What I'm going to be talking about, a rough structure, the problem that we have, and I'm going to suggest a new solution to this problem to you. And then I want to go more into details about estimation fallacies. And instead of just telling you all the problems that you have, I also want to give you some solutions, some new techniques, how to do this. But why am I doing this talk? I think this is really important for me. Um, <clears throat> one of my friends and colleagues, Nora Dunbar, once said that as long as we real psychologists just keep talking just with each other and arguing with each other, which is essentially what we do, there will always be some slick pseudoscientists out there who are filling that void with their articles and their talks and their books and their trading programs. And we find this to be dangerous and we need to do a better job of communicating some real science out there to the practitioners, to the people who can be helped by this knowledge. So let's start off. In the beginning was the gummy bear. Back many decades ago, I used to work as the assistant for a gentleman named Kent Beck, uh, who was the father of extreme programming. And Kent was always very good in throwing problems at me and saying, figure out a way to solve it. And one of the problems he said was that, look, <clears throat> we all like to estimate in units of time, but we're not very good at it come up with an alternative solution. So naive as I was back then, I said, well, okay, what about if we take an abstract scalar unit and we called it the gummy bear because around the corner from the bank where we were working, there was a gummy bear store. And we said, okay, let's call one unit of work a gummy bear. And of course, something that's bigger might be two units of work, two gummy bears will probably take twice as long, et cetera, like that. And we also found that when people were in meetings, eating gummy bears, you were wasting the time that you could actually be doing work. So we found out after we tried this, like we tried many different things. And after a while, we found out, uh, no, we're going to throw it away. It doesn't work. So we went on to try out other different techniques. Unfortunately, this idea about this abstract scalar unit, which is gummy, which is rubber and doesn't really mean anything, uh, got passed on and it got picked up by someone else who rebranded it, and he called it a story point. It's my fault. I apologize. Okay. So let's start. I hope there are some Star Trek fans out there. I'd like to start with this. Back to Starfleet Academy. <clears throat> One of the last tests for a Starfleet commander was the Kobayashi Maru exercise. I don't know if you know it. The Kobayashi Maru exercise went like this. You're a Starfleet commander, and the ship, the Kobayashi Maru, was stuck in the Klingon neutral zone. And you had two choices. Either you could leave the ship when everyone in the ship would die, or you could enter the Klingon neutral zone and try to rescue it, in which case the Klingons would consider that to be an act of war and destroy your ship too. It's a no-win situation. It's nothing you can do to get out of it. And this was a test. Estimation is a Kobayashi Maru. Estimation, we have the problem that we don't have real data on the situation. And the data that we do have is biased. 
the other challenge that we have is that we have a toxic climate in which we're doing this work. So how do we solve this? One possibility is just run away, not estimate. You could do that, right? Another possibility is try to go in there and use some tricks and try to mix up the Klingon so they can't realize that. Um, that doesn't work either. I'd like to bring this quote from my dear friend Raquel at Google, uh, who says, Story points, they like your failed hails to the Klingon ships, asking them to let you enter their space. You know that it's useless and they'll be ignored, but at least when Starfleet finds the log books next to your rotting corpse, you can rest in the satisfaction of saying that you tried and it was all the Klingon's fault. Come on, you did what you were taught in your certified Starfleet master training at the academy, right? So it has to work. Somehow it doesn't work, right? Or you can do something else. You can do, do what Captain James Tiberius Kirk did. And you can change the rules of engagement. And that's what I'm proposing that we do. Estimating in time isn't the problem. The political consequences of estimating in time is a problem. And <clears throat> I wish you could see this on camera. Everybody here in the audience is nodding. Yeah, you recognize that. The problem's not estimating. The problem is the political consequences of estimating in time. And fudging out by using something like story points is not going to help you with that problem. So we have to take another approach, find another solution to this. So the work that I do, the way I try to bring psychology in here, the questions I ask, the problems I try to solve, how do we deal with this biased data? How can we get more accurate results for our estimates by using psychometric statistics, on the numbers and using psychological insights into how people make decisions and understanding how the decision-making process affects the data that people give. On the other side, a toxic climate, how can we integrate psychological safety and trust into the work environment even more so that people aren't afraid to say a real estimate, okay? And to boast the uptake of these estimates as being the best shot in this no-win scenario. That's what I'm trying to achieve. This is how I propose doing it. Psychology, you've probably all heard of psychology. You know that. Psychology deals with people. and We're all people, so we're all psychologists. So you must know that already. Psychometrics, or well, what psychometrics? <clears throat> this is a pharma. I've spoken to a really surprising number of companies, large and small, realized they had data problems. They hired somebody with a PhD called a data scientist, then discovered it's no use having one if you don't know what questions you should be asking. One of the things that we learn to do as psychologists is ask the right questions to get the right answers that we need. So what is psychometrics? <clears throat> In psychometrics, we deal with measuring something that can't be measured. We deal with measuring something that's called a latent construct, okay? So for any of you here live in the audience, I can measure your height, I can measure your weight with a little more effort, you know, measuring telomeres or carbon-14 dating, I might be able to accurately measure your physical age. What I can't measure directly is your IQ or your level of depression or your level of psychopathy, things like that. These are what we call latent constructs. They're things you can't directly measure. So it's interesting that since you can't directly measure a latent construct, any measurement you make is an estimate, okay? So latent constructs, sorry, latent constructs have three aspects. First, dimensionality. How many things play a role in this? With intelligence, back in the beginning of the 20th century with Spearman, uh, Binet, Piaget, they just gave people tests on different things and tried to figure out intelligence. Later, uh, other researchers found that there are many different types of intelligence, fluid intelligence, crystal intelligence, mathematical intelligence, verbal intelligence, spatial intelligence, musical intelligence, and all of these factors together were put into the number that's called the general intelligence. There are many dimensions to this. Second, Reliability. Look, if I estimate something and you estimate something, are we going to get the same results? Right? Or if I estimate the same thing twice, 
Am I going to get the same result twice? This is the issue we have with psychological tests like uh, MBTI, where the answers you get, the results you get depend on which side of the bed you got up on. Okay? So how can we make sure that our estimates are reliable and validity? How can we be sure that what we're estimating is really what we're estimating? Okay, that's the big challenge here. So with psychometrics estimations, this works two ways. So if any measurement of a latent construct is an estimate, the estimate of a work to be done cannot be directly measured except by doing it, in which case you don't need to estimate, right? So an estimate is a latent construct and a latent construct is an estimate, okay? So knowing that, we can use psychometric techniques to help us estimate better, okay? What this can help us do is teach us how do we ask better questions and how do we do better statistics on the answers, remembering that people are a bit special when you ask them to give an answer to a question that their job might depend on. Okay? And psychometrics is how we real psychologists do the Arnold Schwarzenegger and flex our muscles. I can ask better questions than you, and I can prove it with some statistics you won't understand. So that's what this is about. So this is a problem that we have, is how can we get better at estimating? I propose that by using some different tools and different techniques, come from psychology and from psychometrics, we can help anybody get better at estimating. We just have to let go of the way we thought about it beforehand. But before we do that, let's take a look at some of the things that go wrong when we're estimating, some estimation fallacies. I like this one. Still think my favorite thing ever happened to me on the internet is the time a guy said, well, people change their minds when you show them facts. And I said, well, actually studies show that, that that's not true. And I linked two sources to it. And he said, well, I still think it's right. So for me as a psychologist, an estimate says about as much about the person estimating it as it does about the work to be estimated. <clears throat> that goes for any assessment. That goes for things like a scrums master certification. That goes for any agility assessment that tells as much about the person who wrote the assessment, the person doing it, than about what's actually being measured. Okay. I picked up this one uh, recently. I, I have to read this. This is fun, but yeah, 2,000 miles a day isn't that much. Honestly, I could drive that much in a day. And the other guy says, yeah, well, if you drove a steady 75 miles per hour without ever slowing down or stopping, it would take you over 26 hours to drive 2,000 miles, more than a day. And the other guy says, well, assuming you're correct, then let's suppose that I didn't sleep at all, so that I have more time in a day, then I could probably make it. And by the way, what are the sources for your data? And this other guy says, okay, source is 2,000 divided by 75 is 26.667 hours. It's called math. You should try it sometime. And last guy says, well, I'm not sure if I agree, but okay. Okay. So one of the reasons is that people misestimate on purpose. Think about it. They misestimate on purpose. This is one of my favorite pictures of this. Does anybody know what, what this is? This is Berlin Airport, which supposedly opened in 2010. Right? A great example of people bloating their estimates of either underestimating so that they got the job because the government would only take the cheapest provider or overestimating. How, how many times have people you might know overestimated the time they need to do something just to have a buffer so they can relax and do it easily, right? This is part of this type of stuff that goes into the planning fallacy. And the planning fallacy is part of what got these gentlemen, at least the one on the left, the Nobel Prize in economics, okay? <clears throat> Unfortunately, Amos Tversky passed away too early. Otherwise, we would have heard some very interesting things come from the two of them later. So what's the planning fallacy? The planning fallacy happens when you tend to go too much into detail about something and tend to ignore all the other facts and similar cases around you. You start getting so deep into it that you lose 
sight of the total thing that needs to be done and lose sight of anything similar that needs to be done. And this is a cause for a lot of underestimation. So the completeness fallacy. I got an idea from the completeness fallacy <clears throat> from this book, which I highly recommend reading if you have a good stomach. This is about surgery. And this is about a lot of blood and scary stuff. And this is about what happens when a doctor comes to a patient in the hospital and says, you have to have this operation. And it's risky. And the patient says, well, you know, what's the chance of success? And the doctor says, okay, well, about 85%. The question the patient never asks is, is it 85% when you do that or 85% when the head doctor does it? Is it 85%? What's the statistics for this clinic? Or if I have it done in the university hospital or what statistics when it's maybe done out on a battlefield and all this information is missing. And Gwanda says, ask doctors, do we ever tell patients that because we're still learning something, a new or something, their risks are going to be higher. They likely do better going to someone else who has more experience. Do we ever say that we need them to agree to it anyway so that we can learn how to do this? I've never seen it. You know, given the stakes, who in their right mind would agree to these operations? Take a look at this in psychometrics. <clears throat> the estimation equation. This comes from something called item response theory. So the estimated value of X consists of three elements. It consists of the true value of X plus a systemic error which is the error from the person who's doing the estimate plus a random error that comes into every estimate. Okay. Basics of an estimation of a latent construct. So the dimensionality, what does this true value come from? For an estimate, the true value comes from these things. The time needed to do something is a function of the work that needs to be done the person doing it, and the tools and infrastructure that they have available to them, <clears throat> plus something we call a load factor. Take a look at that. The true value of an estimate is a function of three factors, the work, person doing it, and the tools and materials they have available. Somebody please tell me where a story point fits in here. It's none of them. Oh, down the bottom there, there's something called a load factor. Now, a load factor, <clears throat> that's any organizational impediment that will cause us to take longer than we need. Right? Oh, I could have get it, gotten it done if I didn't have that meeting. Right? Uh, oh, you know, uh, you know, the uh, Internet was down. Facilities problems, you know. Oh, you know. They, I needed a new laptop and uh, I didn't get it yet, right? You know, I got, you know, I'd like to do it, but people are constantly disturbing me. Recognize all these things here? The problem with load factors is that there's something that in psychology we call a confounding variable. A confounding variable is one that will affect any or all of these. A, load, a confounding variable might affect the work that needs to be done might affect the way you do that work, right? Might affect who's going to be doing the work if they have the capacity to do it. And it might affect the tools that you have to do it. And this is something that needs to be considered. Another fallacy, thinking big fallacy. Okay. Oh, come on. It'd only take you five minutes. Anybody ever hear that one? Huh? Common and flawed requests get work done a short time scale because the size of the work <clears throat> It doesn't say that there's somebody really available to do it. Estimation by a third party of the time required is a poor practice, right? And frequently that third party has never even done that work themselves. So they have no basis for that estimate, right? So I'm going to do a little psychological test with you. If you have a piece of paper and something to write with, okay. If not, just do it in your head. You'll have to remember four numbers. OK, so I'm going to ask you to do a <clears throat> rough estimate, rounded, rough, you know, over the thumb, 
back of the napkin type estimate. No calculator, nothing else. Hold on. Somebody's eager here and he's actually getting something to write with and write on. Okay. So remember, just a rough estimate. It doesn't have to be accurate. <clears throat> okay, let's go. Now, without thinking too long, without using a calculator, give a rough answer to this question about how long is 100 seconds? You're not supposed to answer, Veronica. <laughs> okay, next one. Without looking, how long is a thousand seconds in a larger unit of time? Hmm? Okay, let's try it again. How long is a million seconds? I think there's somebody in the back there with this calculator. <laughs> okay. How long is a billion seconds? Okay. Have your rough answers. Let's take a look at the answers. These are rough rounded answers. 100 seconds around a minute and a half. <clears throat> a thousand seconds is around 17 minutes. A million seconds is around 11 days. And a billion seconds is around 31 and a half years. Cognitive psychology research has shown us that we think logarithmically. We struggle to work with numbers that are bigger than five. Okay, because they're less relevant to the stuff we do any day. There are actually languages that have, you know, one, two, three, too many, or depending on the number of children, one, two, enough. Right? Right? <clears throat> and this is why millionaires and billionaires, we just think they're really wealthy. We ignore that fact if it's a factor of a thousand. Right? And last month and last quarter are similar in our perception space of time. This is a problem that we have looking at things that are very big, is that we think logarithmically. Okay, another one, distribution fallacy. This is gonna get a little bit more hardcore. Please remember this, an estimate is a range and not a number. And anyone who has had statistics knows this. Estimate is a range and not a number. Some of you who've done classical project management might recognize this, the cone of uncertainty, right? In the beginning, oh, you have that big spread. But as soon as you get, you get to the point where you've delivered it and you know exactly how long it took. The longer further you go, the more accurate you get, right? So what we're looking here, you know, same thing. We have estimates versus actuals. This is the distribution that we expect but research shows differently. Bannertson's research with the SIP data set, 26,000 estimates versus actuals. Carroll's research on comparison be between estimation and story points, the actual time you need. <clears throat> so in the work that I've run myself on the SIP data set, which is open source, it's publicly available. I can give you the code, you can reproduce it. This is real research, shows that the relationship of an estimate to an actual is a log normal distribution. It rarely takes shorter, but there's a lot of reasons it'll take longer, part, even not considering the load factor. So for estimates of three days, see very few that will take shorter, but there's a lot of them. There's a long tail. There's a left skew here, take longer. <clears throat> Obviously, another thing you want to think about here is how much can you get done in a sprint? We're not even talking about velocity now, but how much can you get done in a sprint? Ah, hold it. Oh, let's go back. That's what I needed. Is an inverse log normal distribution there's limits to the physical universe. 
that stop you from getting more work done than a certain amount. But hey, there's all those reasons you didn't get it done because of meetings, right? Because the internet was down, something like that, because you didn't have your computer. There's all these things here. And these are the numbers that we have to start working with. Okay. Okay, next. Groundhog fallacy. Do you ever see that film Groundhog Day? Same thing happens every day, right? How are we going to forecast how much we can do? By this way, uh, this is an excellent book over multivariate time series analysis. I used this in my work at university. I highly recommend it. Right? The quality of any forecast depends on three factors. How well we understand all the factors that are involved, work to be done, person to do the work, the infrastructure, possible load factors, right? How much data do we have available on that? And whether the forecast can affect what's being forecast. Sort of Heisenberg principle applied to estimating. So I don't know if we use velocity or not. <clears throat> I am not making any recommendations about using it or not. If you do do it, you are most probably doing it wrong. So what do we do for when we calculate velocity? We normally take the arithmetic mean, so the average of the last n sprints, where n is a number between 1 and 5. And for you geeks here, I actually only put these slides in because this is the only chance I get nowadays to work in tech. It's really nice types in. Okay? <clears throat> so you're estimating. Your smooth value here is the average of the last number of data sets, where n is between 1 and 5. Okay? All right? Now, one thing we look at as psychologists is what implicit assumptions are in here. And there's one implicit assumption here that invalidates all this. And that's the question. Are all these data points equal in importance? If you're working in two week sprints and you're using the last five sprints, you're telling me that the way your team was working two and a half, almost three months ago, is an accurate representation that you should use as a basis for expecting how much they're going to be able to do in the next sprint. These are people, these aren't machines. That's wrong. So what we do when we do real forecasting work in time series analysis is we work with an exponentially weighted moving average, <clears throat> okay? at saying that <clears throat> the smooth value, so our estimated value, consists of two factors. One is the pure data value at that point in time with a smoothing constant. So how much weight are we going to apply to that? And how much weight are we going to apply to the previous values that we have? And this would then, of course, exponentially diminish because that's also the estimated the smooth value of the iterations beforehand. Now, there are ways of calculating this. I do most of my statistics works in R, which is a really cool language, and essentially it's that. Uh, I just looked last night actually in uh, Excel 2019 for the Mac. There is uh, <clears throat> the technique here. Uh, the tools to do it. We normally use something that's called the Holt-Winters algorithm, which is a numeric optimization algorithm that tries to figure out the best dampening constant alpha. If you don't have that, access to that, uh, Euler's constant is probably the best way to start roughly around that. So what I also did uh, here was start considering what happens. <clears throat> there are a couple ways of forecasting. The way we used to do it in extreme programming is called yesterday's weather. Do you know yesterday's weather? If, if we got, you know, if the weather yesterday was sunny and we don't have any other data, we'll assume that today is going to be sunny. If we did 26 hours worth of work in the last sprint, we don't have any other data. Let's assume we do 26 hours in this sprint. Yeah, same as last time. <clears throat> That's one way of doing it. You can also use the arithmetic mean. Uh, statistics says that if you don't have a normal distribution, you shouldn't be using the mean. You should be using the median value. 
which works better for a skewed distribution. Or you can use the whole Winters uh, algorithm. So what I did was I ran simulations of a thousand sprints, same data estimates versus actual sort of capability in that sprint using all these four methods. Calculated sum of square errors. And let's just say the lower down it gets, the better it is because your errors are smaller and you're a lot closer to the actual values. Okay. Worst was all the way on the left was yesterday's weather. Interesting. Although for skewed distributions, we normally use the median. Second worst was the median, <clears throat> the mean, and below all of them was the whole winters, which is what I'm saying. Use an exponentially weighted moving average, and you get that data feeding in in the right way very soon. Interestingly enough, I went, I took a look at that and said, well, what, what's the distribution of my squared errors using the whole winters? And what I came up with something that I recognized from before, you're getting a log normal distribution of errors. <clears throat> okay, let's go on. That was, that was really geeky. We'll get geeky later, but this is going to be fun. You'll recognize some of these, the objectivity fallacy. Any of these sound familiar? No, I'm not underestimating this. I can do this. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Come on. The new system will make it better. Oh, well, we started with two story points. So it can be three at the maximum, right? Uh, so he, he does Java. He'll be able to do that, of course. Uh, no, don't worry about that one. That's no problem. Yeah, but uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I know you guys are right. And based on the spec here, <clears throat> I see people laughing. You recognize that. The thing is, there are at least 24 biases, cognitive biases that affect <clears throat> but we can't think of all of them at, at that time, right? So what you need to do is become aware of the cognitive biases that affect your decision-making. Up on my website, we have a checklist of questions you should be asking during estimating. Uh, and this is pretty good, but actually, I must say, thanks. Veronica gave me a greater idea a while back where she said, what we really should do is do a cognitive bias bingo sheet that we use then when estimating and see how often these things then come up. Okay. So now I just wanted to point out you know, problems that we have and some of the reasons that <clears throat> we don't even think about that cause us to estimate differently. So let's take a look at some other possible techniques. Okay. Uh, sorry, this is uh, ever since I put on the ah, yes, all estimates are wrong and some are useful. I've paraphrased George Box on that one. And now to pay homage to being in Poland. The map is not the territory. Kosipski. Okay. So people think that there are two alternatives. You estimate in story points, or you estimate in time, right? That's all there is. Let me give you another <clears throat> alternative here. We like estimating in time, but we're not good at it. I'm a psychologist. I can quantify not good. And I can help you quantify not good too. I'll give you an estimate for anything if you allow me to tell you how comfortable I feel about that estimate. Okay, give me an estimate <clears throat> for writing a psychology paper or writing some code. I'm not pretty confident about that. Give me an estimate for building a submarine. Sure, I'll give you a number. I don't believe it myself. So what I do when I ask people to estimate, as I say, I'd like to hear your estimate and also like to hear how comfortable you feel with it saying that you know on this let's do a scale of one to ten ten means i bet my job that i'll need exactly that long not at the most that long i'll need exactly that long i'll bet my job on that a one on the other hand is like well joseph just embarrassed me in front of everybody so i'm going to say a number but i don't believe it and a lot of times your numbers are somewhere in between there 
Okay. <clears throat> so what I do is I like to play a game with people where you say, okay, estimating is a complex activity. So let's say that estimates are complex numbers. Mathematicians, please don't kill me for this. Estimate is a complex activity. Estimates are complex numbers. Estimates consist of two parts, a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is the number, the imaginary part. Come on. This computer is freezing. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Is fear. Now, fear is something that's irrational. It's down in our subconscious, <clears throat> and it always comes up in the worst place. So the problem with fear is that it always influences us in, in the wrong way. So what I would like to do is refactor this estimate, split it apart. Well, let's deal with the two parts separately. Let's deal with the number on one side, and let's deal with all this other fluff separately. So the first thing I want to do is I want to bring this fear up to the surface and rationalize it. And when I rationalize it, what this becomes is risk. Risk is rationalized fear. There's a risk that you might be wrong. Yeah, shit happens. But if in the past, let's say you were a little kid, <clears throat> you told your mom, I'm going to go down the street to play with my friend. And your mom said, OK, but be back at five o'clock for dinner. And you said, oh, yeah, I'm cool. I I, I I can keep track of time. Then 5 o'clock went past, <clears throat> 5.30 went past, 6 o'clock went past, quarter past 6 or so. Your father comes and drags you home by the ear, and you know what happens. Your subconscious remembers that. And they says, tells you anytime somebody asks you for an estimate, say, oh, God, if I give an estimate that's too small, I'm going to get punished for it. That's risk. So what we're trying to do now is quantify this risk. And what we get is value neutral information that we can use for our estimates. And essentially, if you do this often enough and collect the data, what this comfort level becomes is your standard deviation. Over a statistically significant sample size, <clears throat> if you're saying the estimates are a 10, your curve is going to be like this. The lower your comfort level gets, the wider your standard deviation is. But you can actually start calculating this stuff and actually start dealing with it. Right? So that's one of the techniques. What I teach my product owners, so I teach developers estimate like this with the number and with the comfort level. And then I teach my product owners, if developer you know, comes in and says, OK, for this feature, my estimate is blah, 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 and my comfort level is a five. <clears throat> OK, product owner might ask, you know, why a five and stuff. But the important thing I teach the product owner to ask the question, how can I help you make that five into an eight? I'm not even talking about the number now. It's not, can you get it done quicker? How can I help you become more comfortable with that estimate? Because the answer to that question is normally not, I need more time. The answer to that question is, I need more information. And then you engage in an open conversation about this. So <clears throat> no estimate without a comfort level, because that's the only chance of communicating uncertainty in a statistically significant way. OK, another technique I use comes from chronobiology. Chronobiology is the analysis of our bodily rhythms. And there's one, we have different types of rhythms. You have the circadian rhythm, that waking up, going to sleep every day. We have altradian rhythms that go with the cycles of the moon, things like that. We also have Sorry, infradian are the longer ones. Altradian rhythms are shorter ones. The most well-known altradian rhythm is something known as the be basic rest activity cycle, or BRAC, discovered by sleep research back in the uh, 1950s. <clears throat> You're all familiar with this. We have light sleep, dark sleep, rapid eye movement, dreaming, uh, stuff like that. This is one of, uh, this is a sonogram that I did. I keep track of my sleep cycle because I have problems sleeping. So interesting enough, 
the basic rest activity cycle is roughly 90 minutes, somewhere between 70 and 110. <clears throat> now, during the night, it's a sine curve of activity. During the day, it's a curve of cognitive decline. Now, since the BRAC is also a circadian rhythm, it tends to get synchronized with sun sunrise, and we all tend to have a relatively safe same BRAC. And we often see this, you know, we have a high at nine o'clock. We go on for about 90 minutes and then we're tired. And around 1030, instinctively, we take a coffee break. Our body telling us we need a little bit of rest. Take a little coffee break, come back <clears throat> well, quarter to 11, 11 or so. Another run until quarter past 12 or 30 or so. Did you ever ask why you're tired in the afternoon and why it's more difficult to concentrate after lunch? It's not only the blood down in your stomach digesting your food. It's the fact that when we come back after lunch, we're anticyclic. Our lunch break should be 90 minutes. Then we come back at the beginning of another cycle. But if not, we're going to have problems there. <clears throat> so the technique I use that I actually like to use a lot for, um, especially for task level estimating, is something called the Quattro Stagioni method. And it comes from the pizza. <clears throat> and the name actually came from uh, my friend Paolo, and we used to work at a, a, a car company together. Uh, and the idea is, since we tend to split the day into four parts, beginning of the day to coffee break, to lunch, coffee break, or tea time in the afternoon, to the end of the day. Roughly around 90 minutes, okay? Because we don't know how long an hour it is. An, an hour is. Musicians have a better feeling for time smokers have a better feeling for time right <clears throat> most of the time we don't know but we know how long until we need a coffee break i said okay if we have this internal rhythm and that's how we're structuring our working day why don't we just estimate in these units so on task level estimation i try to have tasks that are no longer than a day quattro stagioni estimating is essentially answering this question let's imagine you have nothing else to do tomorrow when you come into work, <clears throat> you start working on this. So nothing else to do. If you come in tomorrow, start working on this. You think it would be done by the coffee break? Or you think you need until lunch? Or you need tea time or you need the whole day? That's it. Okay. Now, the cool thing is when you're doing a group estimation cycle on that, you can do something called speed poker. Now, the fun thing about speed poker is, you know, Stand up and somebody asks that question. Everybody puts their fingers like behind their back and stuff. And you say, let's go. Estimate one, two, three. Right? And then you see <clears throat> what the mean value is and how big the spread is. If the spread is just one or two, just between two numbers, okay, take maybe the middle value of that. If your spread's all over the place, <clears throat> then this is something you need to discuss more. So people can use one, two, three, four stagionis. I don't know. I'm not going to estimate. And, you know, it's fun when you see people doing this. And when they start getting into doing rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, then you know they really like it. Okay. So another technique. <clears throat> and this is one uh, I really like to use. Also, including the comfort level with this is something called reference class forecasting. When I started my own company 20 years ago, the first job I had was doing uh, an expert opinion for the German court on the software that the German railway used to plan to their schedules. As a problem in Germany, it was that they, the people who wrote that program all had PhDs in maths and physics and things like that. And they could calculate <clears throat> at a certain time of day with a certain amount of sunshine, a certain humidity, certain amount of people in the train with how old the wheels were, the distance between the time they take for the distance between two cities plus minus two milliseconds. At that time, over 90% of German trains, ICEs had over 15 minutes delay. Später is German for late. Well, it's funny. When I flew to Warsaw on Sunday, got in 
to the plane and the flight attendant said, our flight to Warsaw is an hour and a half, an hour, 30 minutes. And you know what? Our flight time was an hour, 30 minutes. How do they do that? Did they calculate the wind resistance and stuff like that? No, what they did was reference class forecasting. <clears throat> they have a database of all their flights. Reference class forecasting uh, is described in this paper. This is based on the planning fallacy of Kahneman and Tversky. Essentially what they do in reference class forecasting is you collect similar data. And this is where, you know, if you're using this story point junk, uh, you have some kind of reference story that you compare things to. A reference story is a single data point that has no statistical properties, right? A reference class is a collection of similar data that has all the statistical properties that you need. <clears throat> the all right, so you, you look for a relevant reference class of similar projects you did in the past. Make it broad enough so that you have the strong stats properties, but narrow enough so that it's not too general. Okay, first question here. What happens if we have no experience? We don't have these reference classes. Well, guess what? If you have no experience doing this, your estimates are going to be bad regardless of the technique you use. Then you might start thinking of doing something like extreme programming spike solution. Okay, All right. you identify this reference class and then you establish your probability distribution and the stats for that class, okay? And then you compare your project to that. Say if it's in there, that's what it is. Regress towards the mean, take that as your estimate and consider the standard deviation as, as a comfort level on that, okay? Simple way to do it. Now, if you don't have that and you want to get into doing this, way I start a number of teams is using t-shirts. I just, <clears throat> I have uh, generated from uh, statistical distributions of estimates, I've generated different t-shirt sizes with all the statistical properties in there of log normal distribution, blah, 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 in these sizes. And somebody says, okay, if I estimate that it's going to take one day, you can put that estimation in there, but also say, okay, if it's one day based on these, the data we have, it might take somewhere from three quarters of a day up to two days. And then you can start playing with this. And the more data you get for your own projects, <clears throat> the better your estimates are going to get at this. A couple other things just to close up. Um, shelf life, best by date. Estimates have a shelf life of maximum one sprint and task breakdowns do too. Estimates are based on the current value of two volatile variables. Estimates are based on the current value of the current state of the system. So where you are influences how much time it's going to take to get to another point. And as you're working, you're changing this, right? Which means you're actually changing, invalidating the basis for your estimation possibly. Secondly, Estimates are based on the current state of your knowledge. And as you're working, and also as you're not working, <clears throat> the state of knowledge is changing. You're learning, right? But by doing that, you're invalidating your estimates. So you might want to relook at them occasionally. Also, they possibly invalidate your task breakdown because you might realize there's a different way of doing something. Speaking of task breakdowns, okay, there's a technique in psychology is called unpacking. Now, the research unpacking here comes in this paper from Justin Kruger and Matt Evans. <clears throat> Justin Kruger, you may have heard that name before. Mr. Kruger and Mr. Dunning did a very interesting study. You've heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah. Right? That essentially that stupid people don't realize they're that stupid. Sorry, so a lower IQ leads to a lack of metacognitive facilities, of facilities of self-reflection, to put it properly, right? <clears throat> well, essentially what they say is that if you want to get better in your estimating, break things down and look at them in the smaller units. Where I find this really good and really 
re really makes sense simply without any statistics, no math, anything. It's the fact that when you break things down, you tend not to forget things. Uh, otherwise, something happens. We used to call this the oh shit effect. Oh shit effect, right? You really rush through planning. Don't do a clean task breakdown, stuff like that. You get into the sprint. Two or three days in, somebody says, oh, shit, we forgot. We have to do that. Anybody ever have that happen to your team? Or happen to some team you might know about? <laughs> Put it politely, okay? So, all right. So, next one. Uh, <clears throat> Danzinger et al. They did research on judges in Israel. There was a panel of judges that looked at prisoners petitions for parole get out of jail early card and what they discovered was they were also working in iterations of about two hours or so at the beginning of that period of time they would grant about two-thirds of the requests towards parole towards the end of the time they would grant zero this is a decision fatigue effect this is also what car salesmen use so watch out if you're buying a car right <clears throat> they'll go through so many options stuff at the end you just say oh come on give it to me this type of thing so um what they suggest is to do three things take short rests actually no session longer than 90 minutes take a break in between and when you take a break take a break <clears throat> don't do something aggressive. Do something. Do something funny. Watch an episode of Big Bang Theory. Right? Something like that. And last but not least, use glucose. Getting back to gummy bears here. Glucose is energy for your brain. That's what you need to recover. And by doing that, I'm getting close to the end of my talk, as you know. So my suggestion here, you know, I've given up trying to convince the story point fanboys there's a different way i'd like to follow with buckminster fuller's quote you can never change things by fighting the existing reality to change it build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete okay this is real research which has been done by a lot of people a lot smarter than me and anyone who's ever seen one of my talks knows that this is some of the research and some more of it and some more of it, and some more, and some more, and some more, and some more. And I haven't updated this list lately, but you know, that's sort of the way it is. So uh, going back, I'd like to thank my dear friend, Christine, who does all of <clears throat> uh, my drawings and stuff, who's actually then listening in. Uh, Julie Hendry is a psychologist and agile coach in the UK who helped come up with the idea of the estimation fallacies. Boris Altemeyer, uh, is a professor of psychometrics and statistics at Westminster College in London. And he grilled me on all the stats work. So it's really right. And Veronica, who had this came with this crazy idea of said, well, if you're in Krakow, why don't you give us a talk? Which I did. And now I'm sort of done. Um, I'll spread the link to this later. Uh, there's an, a web page here uh, that provides slides to earlier versions of the talk, provides an Excel plugin, provides all the scripts for the project in R, so you can reproduce all of this, provides links to a number of papers, all that stuff, okay? So one last thing about LinkedIn, you know, this slide, happy to hooking up with you, but I'm, I'm not interested in just collecting things. If you want to link up to me, and I don't know you yet. I expect you to write a little message saying, hi, Joseph, I heard your talk. I think you're full of it. But at least I heard your talk. And now I know where I hear you from. Okay. So LinkedIn recommended you doesn't count. And also, well, you should know me right now also doesn't count. So uh, <clears throat> getting close to finished. Questions. Now it's time for your questions. And I would just like to leave with this slide, which some of you know. The teacher asked her class, does anyone have any questions? And everybody put up their hand. And then she said, well, questions are when you want to know some new information. If you want to tell me about the way you're doing estimating, stuff like that, that's in discussion. We'll have time for that later. Everybody put down their hands. Okay. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> so I may have a question. Do, do we have uh, any offline questions? Uh, for now, nothing for now. So uh, people are scared. <laughs> yeah, it looks so. I hope that the, the microphone collects everything. Okay. So um, so hi. So I I would like to ask you. <laughs> okay. Hopefully hi. it's a real question, not the the one that you. Um, mm -hmm that you showed uh, at the bottom of the slide. So in every IT, in, in many IT companies, mm -hmm. there are projects that take, let's say, about a year, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of things fixed in them, like fixed scope and fixed dates, especially government projects. Mm -hmm. This may be a year, this may be six months, whatever, but they, they are lengthy and they have something fixed. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, in your opinion, or based on your experience, what is the best, what is the best or preferred strategy of making them successful other than let's invest into our estimation accuracy? Mm -hmm. Because this one is one of the most popular strategies I see. Yeah. Let's, let's make our estimates more and more and more accurate so that we finally can foresee a successful finish. Uh, you mean these big things are sort of like the Berlin airport, right? Sort of. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a matter of risk management. How much do you want to nail down? How soon? Because the interesting thing is on the one side, they want to have estimates nailed down, but on the other side, they want to constantly change requirements. Right? So not everything is fixed. Right? And there is no simple answer for that in investing more time and getting estimates more accurate it gets to a point where sort of the quantum computing problem right where <clears throat> there is no supercomputing power in the world that can help me well if you ask me uh, joseph what do you think the weather is going to be like tomorrow i could use yesterday's weather or actually i could go to to google or something like that and look at that but if you ask me and say, uh, Joseph, what's the weather going to be like in Krakow on November 26th? I can see some general trends, but really there's no supercomputing power in the world that can calculate that. What I can say is, you know, I can give you a rough thing. It's probably going to be colder than now, right? But ask me when we get closer. And the thing is to start breaking these projects down into doable chunks, because as soon this gets back to the whole agile thing, are you only you're just going to ship this big bang in one year, right? Yes. And nothing else is going to happen there. Okay. That this is telling me a lot of other problems that you have and estimation is the least of them. So what we're looking at here, I am really tempted to go to the flip chart. I just want to say, sorry, people on thing. I am going to go to the flip chart. I'm going to go to the flip chart. I'm going to bring the flip chart over here. And I see there's nothing for writing on the flip chart. Uh, yeah, there is, like there is. Uh, so, so the, Joseph, uh, maybe in, in a time, in the meantime, yeah. I, I can yeah. paraphrase something. So yeah. I, no, have a feeling, have, I have a feeling that we feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. So help us with those fixed everything mm -hmm. projects that the only smart thing that we invented is investing into more and more accurate estimates. Yeah. And I'm I'm, I'm looking for you know inspiration or some experience. Or some excuses, yeah. Other <laughs> <laughs> uh, things are worth investing into. Yeah. To to make these projects as yeah. much successful as possible. It yeah. Was actually, I think similar question from uh, chat. So, is it possible to switch our estimation from time based to other? Yeah, also. Uh, yeah, let's let's know? let's be honest. Regardless of, you know, every team I've seen that use story points, the first thing they do is calculate their exchange rate. Basic story points are a are a process smell. They're a smell of a psychologically unsafe environment, of a toxic climate, where you're trying to avoid addressing the elephant in the room. 
that's the thing. And <clears throat> what they do is they, uh, they allow you to do arbitrage and essentially say, it's the only way that you can say, well, you know, well, last, last sprint, the story point meant one day. And this is, well, we didn't mean it like that. We've just changed our exchange rate. And that's what it's allowing you to do. But using it is not going to get rid of the basic problem that your data is biased and that you're in a toxic environment. And until you start getting rid of those problems, you're not going to be able to get better at it. So just a couple of thoughts that I have. One is the classic thought that uh, I'm giving you Kent's version of this. This is the way we did it in XP. Time, resources, quality, scope, choose three. You can only choose three. Whichever three you choose, your fourth one will be a function of the other three. Managers often do not understand that. They believe they can have all four under control. And when they try to grab the fourth one, what happens? What's the first one they lose? Quality. Second one they lose, they ship later always happens like that right <clears throat> the scope has to be there and we're not going to get any more budget for it so there's a long story that i would tell if i had to, um actually have some time i'm finished on time hold on for a second um but back in an earlier life i actually used to be a musician and <clears throat> a couple years ago a friend of mine called me up and asking me if I could help his teenage son. This was around September or so, end of September, and school had started, and his teenage son was like in his second last year of high school. And he played in a hard rock band. And the hard rock band had a chance to play their first public concert at the Christmas party of the school. And it's sort of obvious why, why teenage boys play hard rock, right? So they wanted to impress the girl. So they wanted to play really well. And it seemed it wasn't going that well. So father asked me, is there something, you know, you used to play guitar. Is there something you could do? I said, sure, I can do it. But I realized that I'm not going to be able to go in there, me bald-headed, fat and old, and tell all these young boys what to do. But what I could do is give them the tools to make the decision themselves. So I decided to go in and say this. <clears throat> Look. Guys, what I hear here is you want to play all these songs at Christmas. You're practicing once a week. So if you've chosen these three, the problem that we have is this one, right? And the thing is, quality is important because honestly, playing a bad concert is worse than not playing one at all. Because nowadays, what happens? You play a bad concert, somebody's going to be out there with their iPhone and they're going to record that and put it up on YouTube. And 20 years later, people will walk up to you and say, no, oh, you the guy that played that bad concert, right? So quality is important. So if you want to play all these songs at Christmas and you want to play them well to impress the girls, that means you have to practice more. No, that didn't work. Because, you know, last year of school, they had a lot of tests to get into university and stuff like that. Okay, good. If that doesn't work, next one. You want to play all these songs well to impress the girls, and you can only practice once a week. What does that mean? That means not Christmas, maybe Easter. No. They wanted to play it soon, right? They, they, they really were missing the interaction. So I said, look. The only solution you have, if you want to play well to impress them, you want to play soon, and you can only practice once a week, is to talk about reducing scope. Play less songs. And then I left them and said, look, it's your choice. You have the responsibility. Whoever has the risk makes a decision. Think about it and let me know what you think. And they, I wish I had a video of this because they really didn't talk much, but it looks like they were all chewing lemons. 
can you hear the mice going up here? Until eventually they came to think, and said, okay, I'll play less pieces, but you know, how do we do that? We don't want to just stand on stage for five minutes. Otherwise, they, nobody would get to see us. Look, <clears throat> there's secrets to doing that. And for any of you who have been at a concert, you've probably seen that secret. The big secret to making your concerts longer and pressing them is called the drum solo. Right? So everybody else walks off the stage and the drummer, the, the drummer, of course, thought this was a great idea. Uh, my friend's son, who was a guitarist, said, well, what about me? And so I gave him some tricks to show off and you know, headbanging, stuff like that. Uh, and actually, they uh, played a really good concert, all based. Thank you, Kent Beck, for this. But another thing that I wanted to talk about is the following. So what you're talking about is you're going to start here, right? Bang! All of a sudden, you're going to get all this value after a year, right? So a lot of incremental approaches say, okay, we'll start here, and then we'll try to do something like this, right? You all know this from all your agile training. This is where we're going to try to get. What I'm looking at doing is continuously and looking at getting the most value as quickly as possible doing a curve like this, right? And this is total value under the curve. Okay. So the other interesting thing here is risk. This is T0. This is T1 or T of first delivery, right? Risk is one over the definite integral here. The area under the curve. <clears throat> so the bigger the area under the curve, the less risk you have of getting value right the bigger the area curve the more, more value you have and the less risk you have because you're already getting something interesting here is if you haven't delivered anything until then this is division by zero you can't can't even predict how much risk you're going to have by doing that right and this is a basic technique that i used to try to explain this this one's more fun to explain but that's the other one other than that i don't yeah, I can't pull the rabbit out of the hat. I don't have a solution. For that. And what do you think about the buffers? Do you think it's a, it's a practice that? Uh... Um, that helps compensate the bad estimation. Oh, let me put it this way. Yeah. If you start using going away from techniques you use and start using techniques like this, you're going to have the buffers built in in your standard deviations anyway. All right? An estimate is a range and not a number. An estimate is a range and not a number. Write that and put it up on the thing. And that's what you're going to have. And you have, <clears throat> you have quantified values for your minimum and maximum and your uh, mean and medium. And that's where you can start using those values then to discuss about putting buffers in. But it assumes you have data from the past. Yeah. Oh, well, once again, if you don't have any data, your estimates are going to be screwed in spite of any estimation technique. So how much risk do you want to take? What I would do is I would do a little bit and learn from it and have that learning informing my future estimations. <clears throat> and this is what the whole Winters model of time series analysis brings, is informs, right? If you're using a, a moving window average, five, last five sprints, you have to have five sprints worth of data before you can even start calculating an average. With Holt Winters, you get the value from the second sprint already, and it tracks a lot better, right? So this is, 
there there is work available. We just have to get out of that mindset. And this is why I, I, I use the quote from Fuller. You have to come up with a new model. But can we take this offline for later? Sure. Because there may be another. Yeah, I have one question from uh, Charles in the chat. Uh, how to bring the right culture to an organization which allows estimating in the right way? Oh, that's that's my talk on psychological safety. <laughs> but, but essentially, this is this is um, what you need to do is build up a culture of trust. Now, stop talking about psychological safety. There, you know, there are enough companies now, or consulting companies, who have their psychological safety practices. Say, bring us in, we'll do a talk, and you'll be safe. Uh, there's there are other companies that sell a different type of safe, but um, you know. Uh, focus on trust. Trust is the, a personal attribute. Psychological safety is an environmental attribute <clears throat> that occurs as a re result of these personal interpersonal attributes, right? If you have trust, if management has trust in developers, and developers have trust in management, management knows that developers will give an accurate estimate because they're not going to be attacked for that right estimating in time isn't the problem the political consequences are and that's what you're going to have to deal with and if developers know that they are not going to have their heads chopped off for giving a real estimate that really reflects then they'll be more confident to doing it how often have you heard this thing you know we don't have the time to do it right but we uh, spend a lot of time fixing things afterwards it's the same thing So maybe question about this a human factor in an estimation or prediction because uh, people have a knowledge and uh, experience based on their different team members and they are changing and we can predict we can calculate that you know the certain job can be done in a days by the team we know and we we have you know the, the rotation and the team is changing and. In fact, uh, how to secure our you know, calculation, and we don't know if we'll get you know the more experienced people or less experienced people. Mm -hmm. So, the question is how to take an estimate which is based on a single person and spread it out so it <clears throat> will be covered by the risk of team members changing. That's essentially the thing. This actually goes back to the original idea behind wideband Delphi, which is the basis of, of planning poker. And I remember Jim Brenning telling me that you know the basic idea of this is that, let's say, you're better than me at something, so your estimate's probably going to be lower than mine. I'm better than you at something, my estimate's going to be lower than yours. If you have a statistically significant sample size, these things start balancing themselves out. This is essentially law of large numbers theory. It tends to break down in smaller size, but this is essentially what it gets back to. Can we find a number <clears throat> that will buffer this statistical uncertainty about who's going to do the job? And um, you can calculate that quantitatively. It was just a pain to do that. Or you can also start doing some techniques like like using uh, a planning poker or idea of discussion, right? Just using some real units and not some fake units. That's, I think, the way I would do it. Another question is what, uh, and this is a question towards management, is do they realize what happens when the team composition constantly changes because it's not only that number it's the whole fact of the interaction between the team members and the build up of the way and the smoothness of interaction build up the amount of trust they have with each other and that's often more important when you have a good well working team and ripping that apart that hurts a lot more than just having you know an, uh, an estimate rounded differently No, 
not much, not more comments. There was um, like more like a comment that some people prefer Pomodoro methods for like estimating uh, time. Okay, uh, Pomodoro method is an interesting method which I also use. Although there is there is no serious psychological research that supports the Pomodoro method. Uh, there is a possible connection uh, to the was the ACP axis uh, the uh, in neuroscience, which is what keeps our stress level up after an initial dose of adrenaline goes down, which is essentially about how long can you tolerate doing something you don't like to do. <clears throat> so in spite of the fact that there is no serious psychological research on this unit of time, I use it a lot myself, especially if there are things I don't like to do. And the nice thing is that three pomodori fit in one stagione. Do 25 on, five off, 25 on, five off, 25 on, and then you take a 20 minute break. So I, I always do the stagione is being 90 minutes, 15 minute break, plus minus. You're just building three Pomodoris in there. But Pomodoris, I find not useful as a unit of estimating. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, what, what uh, is if your... you can close, sorry, because, because yeah. Yeah. So uh, what is European on uh, no estimates approach? Okay. Uh, advantages, disadvantages in your opinion. Um, I know Vasco Duar from back at our time at Nokia. Sorry, I'm saying this is the wrong company. Uh, together back in the mid 2000s, where we we're discussing estimating a lot. <clears throat> and so essentially, you know, people like estimating units of time, which is we're not good at it. He and I went in a bit different direction. Uh, I said, okay, how can I, I can quantify not good. He, what he did was some interesting experiments where he took the estimates of teams done in story points and looked at the number of stories they did and found that uh, Pearson's R, product moment correlation, was significant high, so like above 0 0.8 or something like this in a lot of cases and said, look, if you cut your stories right, you don't need to estimate. And I think this is valid. Now, learning how to cut your stories right, this small sizing, getting everything down between one and two days, this is also the type of stuff that Josh Karievsky was talking about at the beginning of the 2000s in, in XP. So that's one thing. The smaller the stories are, of course, statistical properties of deviation and stuff like that are also going to be small, right? And it's easier to deal with things that are between zero and five than bigger. So all that stuff comes into play. Now, no estimates I find interesting as an intellectual challenge to organizations and to management. It's not necessarily something I would use myself, but it's something that really critically asks the question about why are we doing this? What is it bringing us? Can we invest this energy doing something something else that will help us a lot better. So for that, as I say, I think it's a good idea. It's not something that I use in my practice, but I think it's a very important contribution to the discussion about estimating. Yeah. Okay. Now we have no more questions. Yeah. Anybody in the room? Yeah. Then I would like to say thank you for having me in on a free day. Let me conclude this session. Okay, so there are no more questions. Uh, Joseph, thank you very, very much for uh, for accepting our invitation. Mm -hmm. and for... You're getting close to me. <laughs> I got vaccinated. No. But that's okay. I'm, I'm vaccinated too. Go out, get vaccinated. Don't be afraid. I didn't have any side effects. Okay. So... <laughs> So have a good afternoon, everyone, yeah. and uh, watch our social media, watch our Facebook, because we're going to be posting more invitations to you uh, regarding our webinars about our <coughs> Agile Pulse. Uh, so stay with us. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.